dealing with your own COVID bouts and uh, being with family who have been positive, welcome back and extended Happy New Year to everybody as well. Uh, a few announcements today. Uh, as we see, there will be a to-go coffee hour today. Hopefully we'll resume something a little more normal next week along with SOCL. Today there will be none uh, in terms of that. Uh, this week, just want to make mention that I believe we're still planning on having Bible study on Wednesday evening. Newsletters for the month of January were emailed and placed in your parish mailboxes. They'll be dropped in the mail early this week. Our pick a number fundraiser, we just want to make sure we address that. There's uh, still the tree that's in the entrance of the fellowship hall. Uh, just a few numbers left. I think we all grab when we'd be done today. No pressure. And finally, just making note of some meeting rescheduled. Our parish committee meeting and installation of our new parish officers will be January 23rd, and our annual meeting is February 6th. And of course, everything is fluid at this time. Uh, we make mention that our today's intention for Holy Mass will be uh, the Most Reverend John F. Swantek, who passed away this past week. Uh, I wrote about him in our newsletter, so I won't wax poetically any more on him. You can read that there and sort of uh, my relationship and what I thought about the man. Uh, but I will make mention of this, which I found out when I woke up this morning uh, via the magic of the internet, uh, that the last Mass he listened to was last Sunday's via St. Mary's in Parma, Ohio. Not being able to leave his house, his uh, family was able to tune in the way we have it here, so good stuff. Um, one of the things that he uh, often said when I was a young seminarian uh, with him was he had already had his funeral laid out back in like the early 2000s, and so that what he wanted more than anything was Easter hymns at his funeral, and he wanted it to be in the middle of Christmas, so everybody would be like, why are we doing this? So I'm looking forward to this Saturday to see if that has held steady some 15 or so years later, um, but we offer Mass for his soul this day. Uh, today is the baptism of our Lord. We celebrate the solemnity on an annual basis, always near the New Year, usually around the second Sunday of the New Year. Um, and again, it welcomes and it changes uh, that whole script of our Lord from the story of his childhood and his boyhood to uh, that of when he is an adult. So we celebrate our contemporary rite of the Mass this morning with Gloria, with Creed, and then we quiet our hearts and minds as we pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord bless us with the wisdom to praise you in spirit and in truth, so that by following your holy will, we may gain eternal salvation. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, please now kneel and make a personal and private examination of conscience. Confessing your sins before our Lord and God. And having confessed your sins before the Lord, please now recite with me the second form of the Confidior. I confess to Almighty God, in the presence of the Blessed Virgin Mary, all the saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in my own fault, in my thoughts, in my words, in what I have done or failed to do. I ask the Blessed Virgin Mary, all the saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. And as an act of penance this day, I ask that you offer the prayer to the entirety of our Polish National Catholic Church throughout this week for the repose of the soul of Bishop John F. Swanta. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. And may our Lord Jesus Christ absolve you, and with his authority vested in me, absolve you from all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. After Jesus was baptized, he came up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened before him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming upon him, and a voice came from the heavens, saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. He shows the face in the meeting of the Lord, and his faithful life of the Lord. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, the world without end. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. Glory to God in the highest. And peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father. Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and the glory of God the Father. Amen. O Lord, be with you. Spirit and power. He 
but about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. This is the word of the Lord. there's a sliver of doubt that it ain't going to come true. That those expectations are not going to be met. It's the expectation that once the weather gets warmer, nobody's going to be sick anymore. And sometimes we quite generally say that we have great expectations for someone or some event or something. And the more we say and think about the expectations we have for the event, the more we get disappointed. Just ask Tim Couch, Johnny Manziel, Baker Mayfield, and so on and so forth. Expectation was an Advent buzzword as well. Uh, it was in many of our hymns, and partly because Advent was so darn prophecy-based. The New Testament church we are, we love to see those portions of New Testament scripture flesh out those Old Testament prophecies. We love to show our work as well as our scripture does today. The 42nd chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah speaks not only of the coming Messiah, but what his ministry would entail. Not just that there would be a guy, but this is how that guy would be that guy. I formed you, speaks of the Messiah being divine. Isaiah says how the Lord will say, I formed you. It speaks to that this will be just that guy. That guy will be divine, the son of God. I 
Okay, it says that he will be a light for all nations. It speaks to Jesus' people. And it was nations, plural. As many of you follow each and every Sunday, especially from Christmas, those three kings make their way from St. Mary's altar and go across the way here from the pulpit. And last week they're on the lectionary, and it's always so awkward because the collectors put the pans there after they collect. I put communion up there when I distribute, so it's, it's really awkward and noticeable. But they're home today. And I saw a number of people stop to pray before the completed manger today to look at how everything had come to be. And the kings being present among everybody else there to show how Jesus was, the Messiah was for all nations. As those kings from Orient are, as we'll be singing in about 10, 15 minutes, show that it wasn't just those Jewish chosen people. Isaiah says that the Messiah to come would open the eyes of the blind. It showed that a portion of the Messiah's work would be miraculous, and that healing would come forth from him, and how important that would be. Keep your eyes out for that. Because let it be known that many people knew this and created all sorts of different faith healings in order to be noticed, in order to gain notoriety. Isaiah said that the Messiah to come would bring prisoners from confinement and spoke to the freedom from sinfulness that the Messiah would bring, even if they didn't really notice it until after they put him on the tree of the cross. And that he would bring forth those who live in darkness. It would reflect on how he bended towards those who saw little light in their life at that point. The poor, women, those who were from mixed races, or the wrong race as it were, the contagious as well. All these Jesus would bring from darkness. I mean, all of that that I pray, Isaiah prophesied some 600 years before the coming of Christ really shows what he would be. But we also get a different vantage point. That was a good preview of it. And we have to attach some, uh, you know, looking back on it in order to say, oh, that's how that one fit. That's how those puzzle pieces fit. In the Acts of the Apostles today, Peter gives a retrospective on what Jesus' ministry was, uh, just about in real time, for somebody who was a direct eyewitness to it. The totality of his ministry. The group detaining Peter was at Caesarea. And Caesarea was an affluent port town. It was in Israel, in Judea, sort of, uh, you know, right on the Mediterranean Sea. It was built by one of the Herods to be one of those crown towns. This is where you would have to come through in order to bring trade to this portion of the world. It was a cesspool of good and bad as well. There were all sorts of different faiths, which meant it was ripe for Peter and for the disciples to come and minister Christianity to. Cornelius was a God-fearing person, but he was troubled in what his faith was going to be. And he became the first Gentile convert. Again, one who was not Jewish, who was outside the realm of uh, Judaism, who became a Christian, paving at that moment a clearer path for the apostles' ministry. Because to that point, think of the apostles. They were 12 Jewish men who followed a Jewish guy named Jesus, who followed the Jewish law, and when Jesus uh, was crucified, died, was buried, and arose, and then ascended to heaven, they were still 12 Jewish men who knew Judaism, but now they knew Christ as well. So they had to figure out how to mix Judaism with this Christ who they knew to be Messiah. That's why they weren't sure how to preach to those who had never heard of Judaism as well either. That was their only frame of reference at looking at religion. In Cornelius' house, Peter preaches Christ. And the totality of what his ministry was, and what it was supposed to mean to somebody who had never heard of him before. And seeing that God showed no partiality in his vast love, which Peter saw through everything that Jesus did in his ministry. Peter especially mentions how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. I mentioned at the beginning of Acts, they're bobbing around in the Advent season and Christmas and the uh, before Jesus was born and the early life of Jesus, his infancy, and as he was growing, we encounter in the gospel the adult Christ for the 
first time since November. And though we don't, we don't miss him per se, because we can always pick up a Bible and, and read the gospel and see Jesus' actions, I always feel that the, the number of weeks, the four, five, six week departure from healing of his hearing of his adult ministry makes us long for it. Makes us think that we really had a passage of time that prepared us to enter this ministry again. And then we see that expectation, the word that greets us in the gospel. I'm sure when John was preaching and when John was baptizing the River Jordan, the number was more like closer to what we have here today than uh, perhaps in those who are going to be cheering, name your football team today. Closer to the dozens or a hundred than the tens or hundreds of thousands. But there was a palpable swell in the gospel today that John might be the Christ. Everything about his ministry was coming to a head right there. All that prophecy that they knew, like from Isaiah, all the waiting that they had been doing, all the desire for freedom which John preached through, through uh, baptism and through uh, repentance, all that salvation, and here it was. So they looked at their Messiah, or maybe he was the Messiah, and he was wearing camel hair, he didn't live in a house. He probably stunk a little bit. He looked more rugged than maybe they thought he would look like when they thought that Isaiah spoke of him when he said that this is the one who shall bring forth justice to all the nations. They still thought he might be the Christ. And with all that expectation, Luke's gospel isn't quite as dramatic as telling of the exact event of Christ's baptism as perhaps in Matthew's or even Mark's. John was baptizing, Scripture says, and among those who were baptized was Jesus. The end. That's it. He was baptized. Nothing happened in the moment of him being dunked under the water that we so uh, theatrically think about in our heads when we hear this gospel or when we see the pictures on the front of our bulletins. It just happened in St. Luke's gospel. Here he was. Then the drama does hit a little bit. After Jesus prays, and I can't even imagine, you know, when we pray, we can feel close to God, and sometimes we don't feel as close to God in our prayers. It depends on our day and our distractions. But Jesus had that direct line, a landline, or whatever we might think of it now, right to God. And Scripture says that after he was baptized, he prayed, and then stuff started to happen. Then the drama just hit. And for a second time that we have all heard since Midnight Mass, the heavens opened. Heavens don't open up too much, but the heavens opened up right here again. The Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus bodily like a dove and blazing above our altars shows that anointing of Jesus by God the Father. Anointing to be somebody different and to be something more. To minister. Anointed to be the gospel, the good news to people. Anointed to carry the name of Christ. Leaders were anointed. That was a thing that happened. We don't really anoint leaders anymore. Kings were anointed in oil, you know, just dredged in oil and left covered in oil in order to set them apart, to mark them as holy. Because they would never forget the time that they had oil poured upon them. And for anybody who's ever cooked in a kitchen, you know you can't really wash oil off very easily. It has to be, especially on your skin, that much. It has to be scraped off. And even 2,000 years ago, they knew that if you took a stone, because you had to use a stone, and scraped the oil off your skin throughout your whole body, you were scraping off that top layer of skin, and what was left afterward was a new person, a new layer of skin, and a new existence, a new being for that person who was anointed, forever set apart by that act of anointing. This act of baptism, dunking into water, and that descended spirit, the anointing by God, was God's way of fleshing out that very act of anointing for his son. In Luke's gospel, we don't hear it today, but the following paragraph launches into the ancestry of Jesus. And it's tough, tough to read, lots of hard names there, but it's cool to see where it ends up. From Jesus, through Joseph, all the way to Adam, the one created by God. And though we don't hear John behold Jesus as the Lamb of God in today's version of the baptism as we hear in others, 
we get a last snippet of prophecy at this event that began Jesus' ministry, that Jesus would baptize with fire and the Holy Spirit, that his life by that fire would purify people from sin and lead to the presence of the Holy Spirit for everybody, that people would no longer ever be left alone from the presence of God. And that's what we all carry in our baptisms. When the priest, whoever it was, whether it was me for some of the kids here, or whether it was some long-departed priest or bishop for many of you, when he breathed on you and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So the title of the Solemnity of Our Lord's Baptism today, this is alternately the first Sunday of Ordinary Time. Ordinary time with the priest wearing green from throughout most of ordinary time. We'll get in a couple of weeks and then jump out into Lent and Easter. But today with the baptism of Christ, the presence of the Spirit, and that tacit anointing by Almighty God, Christ is ready to begin his sacred ministry. The sacred ministry that would change the world forever. And we see all the prophecy and ingredients that went into beginning it today. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Shannon Alberino, 
Eugene Megan, Diane Black, Jennifer Kless, Jack Spilka, Jim Giles, Tom Slumka, Kim Penny, Nina Burkett, Nancy Koha, Johanna Markevich, Dolly Olson, Al Pinecki, Bill Cassett, Joseph Bischoff, David Micah, Ron and Joe Jureski, Mike Paulus, Shauna, Michelle Ostrowski, Jacob Sternowski, the entire Swan Tech family, for all those other bereaving loss, for all our prayer lists, for friends and family members, we pray to the Lord. For the departed whose memory we recall this day, that the power of God's grace may bring them to the fullness of glory, especially Prime Bishop John Swantek. For all departed friends and family members of our parish, we pray to the Lord. Lord Almighty God, by our baptism, you adopted us as your sons and daughters. Hear our prayers through that favor which rests on your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, who lives forever and ever. Amen. You are aware that we who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were indeed buried with him through baptism into death. But just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so you might live in newness of life.
Now walk in the newness of life. We pass this through the same Jesus Christ, who lived and reigned with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, O forever and ever.
supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which shall be shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. We now celebrate the memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and ascent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting his coming in glory, and offering to you from the gift you have given us, this bread and this cup. We praise you and bless you. We praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, and we pray to you. Pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and showing them to be holy gifts for your holy people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. We grant that all who share this bread and this cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. Remember Anthony, our prime bishop, Jerry, our bishop, and all who minister in your church. Remember all your people and those who seek your truth. Remember all who have died in the peace of Christ, whose faith is known to you alone, especially the most reverend John F. Swanson. them into the place of eternal joy and light. We grant that we may find our inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary, with our ancestors in faith, with the prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, Creator, above all, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, go forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray with confidence to the Father, in the words our Savior gave us. Christ, you said to your apostles, and leave you peace, my peace I give you. 
Do not look at our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. <coughs> the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. We take this time to offer each other an appropriate sign of our Lord and Savior's peace. bring me to everlasting life. This is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to the table of the Lord. And those worshiping at home and those here who choose to receive spiritually, we offer our act of spiritual communion. Most loving Jesus, I adore you in the most blessed sacrament, in which you are truly present. I love you above all things, and I long for you in my soul. Since I cannot receive you sacramentally, I ask you to come spiritually into my heart and heal my soul. I embrace you and unite myself with you. May I never be separated from you. And flame my heart with the fire of your love, my Lord and Savior.
Thank you. 